Um, so thank you all so much for coming to our last installment of the speaker series. So every Tuesday we've had advocates on our team um, come and chat a little bit about what it means to address systems of power within their work. A lot of times domestic violence work we're, involves combating power and control, but our own work can involve power and control. Um, and so for the first week we heard from Sarah Parker in our community advocacy program. The second week we heard from Katrina Henry in our home safe program. The third week we heard from Danielle Weeks also in our community advocacy program. And then our last week is from my very own program. So I am excited because these are my pals, these are my colleagues, um, Hilary Bowker and Mish Vergara. And they are both part of our social change team here at New Beginnings. Um, and we're going to be talking about what is adultism. So Hillary and Mish, um, would you both like to share a little bit more about yourselves, your experience, and what you're excited to talk about today? Yes. Mish, do you want to go first? Sure. sure. sure yeah. Thank you, Neba. Um, I am Mish. My pronouns are she and her. And I am the new prevention educator on our team, along with Victoria. Um, so prior to this work, which I joined in um, May this year, um, I was doing mainly housing and homelessness services, both in the um, nonprofit insurance sector, as well as uh, direct homelessness services in the Seattle area. Um, and prior to that, I was doing uh, peer health education in college at UW. Um, so that had been my, you know, most recent experience back with teaching and uh, community education and stuff like that. Um, so I ha haven't worked before with our population of, of kids. Um, so this is really my first deep dive into that, but it's been, it's been very fun so far. Um, yeah. And I it just in general have a background in suicide prevention as well um, and peer health education, like I said, and um, yeah, just very happy to be here. So thank you. And Hillary, do you want to? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mish. Um, yeah, and um, I'm Hillary. I use she/her pronouns. I am our social change program manager, um, and um, my background actually my background's in social work. And um, I I started with New Beginnings um, nine, ten, almost. I've lost all sense of time. Nine or ten years ago, um, working. Um, with uh, survivors in our uh, former shelter program, um, doing direct service. Um, but really my passion was always um, for um, prevention work. And so um, this is actually my seventh, seventh school year doing prevention work with, um, with middle schoolers. Um, and really grateful that this past year, our program expanded um, and is no longer just me, but we have a full social change team, including me, Victoria, Neva, and um, just really, really exciting time. Um, Mish and I will talk a little bit more about what we do specifically with middle schoolers, um, I'm sure later on, but essentially we um, facilitate healthy relationships um, curriculum with middle school students and also provide one-time workshops for um, high school students, college age students, do some professional development for folks who work, work with young people, um, teachers, parents. Um, and uh, my first job, I just want to say as some context, I think was really when I started first started thinking about adultism, even though at the time I didn't really have the language for it. Um, but my first social work job was actually a place called Shel the Shelter Inc. in Lawrence, Kansas, um, where we worked with, um, it, I worked in a, a couple different group homes for children in need of care. So kids in the foster care system who didn't have, like weren't currently in a foster home. Um, and uh, it was a deeply troubling experience that I think really speaks to um, how normalized adultism is. So um, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But glad to be here. So we've already dropped in the term, or we've already dropped it in at least once, twice. What is adultism? Yeah. Yeah. So I think essentially adultism is, you know, the power, the power and control that adults have over children and teens. That's institutionalized. Um, 
and that children's and children and teens really have limited agency um, in a lot of contexts and contexts um, and are often unable to make meaningful decisions about their own lives because of their because of their age. Um, and, you know, I am a new mother of a one year old. And, you know, of course, there are times when we need to protect children. And, you know, consequently, that sometimes means limiting limiting their agency, you know, especially for really little ones who you know, don't have necessarily have the capacity to always make safe decisions, right? Um, you don't stop them from eating the marble or whatever. Um, you know, sometimes you have to make those choices, but um, but really the issue is that the dismissal of kids um, and children and teens' feelings, um, thoughts op and opinions is just, you know, really pervasive um, culturally um, and in most institutions, including in schools, maybe especially in schools. Um, and, can, and, and also among parents, um, you know, and teens and children are, are really young people are a group whose marginalization, I feel like we actually take less seriously and you hear, you, you really don't hear it talked about often at all. It's just, it's very, very normalized. Yeah. And um, kind of jumping off of that um, from Hillary, I think one part of that, uh, you know, pushing aside the uh, adultism conversation is this distinction of adultism from just ageism in general. Whereas we, when we think of discrimination based on age, I feel like the conversations are usually geared toward adults, like, um, you know, uh, elder discrimination and um, uh, being in the workplace and you being the younger person, stuff like that. But adultism has to do with all of us adults kind of unpacking and recognizing that we all practice adultism in our lives. Um, it's like Hillary said, an institutional um, kind of mindset that has been uh, really implemented from us in the beginning, even as children, we are taught in our institutions like schools and with our families, like adults know best. And that that, that is a very Western, very white <laughs> based um, kind of idea, right? Um, and we have a lot of uh, kind of real life examples that are popping up right now with regard to um, adultism. And I think one that I wanted to highlight is um, <clears throat> with COVID-19 vaccinations and vaccinations in general, um, we are seeing a influx of young people who are eligible to get a vaccine, but their parents or guardians are not allowing that um, for whatever reason they may consider themselves anti-vax, um, you know, but but regardless, they, the parents are um, kind of having this power over their children and saying, no, you don't have that right. I don't recognize that right for you to, you know, access your own healthcare needs. Um, and we're seeing examples, I'll link an article in the chat um, of, you know, young people standing up and, and testifying in Congress about how this is something that they, have determined that it is needed for them and they should have the autonomy to pursue that. So um, yeah, we're, we're seeing examples like that. Um, Hillary and I are running into students who are um, encountering problems with teachers, including, um, you know, we, we met one young person who said that they used a mix of pronouns. They used they pronouns as well, but their math teacher said, you can't do that. You can't mix your pronouns. Um, you have to choose either she, her, or they, them, um, which we know is is not true. I think adultism really has to deal with like language is always changing, ideas are always changing, paradigms are always shifting. Young people um, are getting more and more access to information that we didn't necessarily have when we were their age, um, and they're connecting with other people who are experiencing the same things as they are and feeling the same things as they are. And that's really creating this awesome coalition of young people who are um, just supporting each other. And we're, we're seeing that, we're seeing young folks support each other um, in combating adultism in that way in, in places like schools. Um, Hillary, did you wanna add on to that? I mean, yeah, I was just gonna say like, I, yeah, I think a lot of times you're kind of speaking to like, some intersections there around like cis sexism. And I think, you know, adultism is often something that is also like compounding other isms. You know, um, if a teacher, you know, is 
you know, if a teacher is being, you know, racist or um, transphobic, you know, they might feel much more emboldened um, to act that out with children than they would with an adult peer um, and to minimize, <clears throat> yeah, like you said, to minimize young person's um, identity in that way, like publicly in a classroom, you know, to minimize and like chastise a pronoun that, you know, the, the, the pronouns that that a child, that a young person is choosing to use. Um, and then I also wanted to add on to, um, you know, uh, piggybacking off the, you know, the vaccination debate, um, you know, also like how that that intersects with with other healthcare choices, um, you know, and we're really lucky in um, in Washington that we have more progressive um, policies around like age of consent for for healthcare. Um, but you know, there are a lot of states where students, you know, young people can't get therapy if they want it, and you know, until they're they're much older. In Washington State, it's 13, which is pretty young, and I think that's really great. Um, and I'm not sure it's good enough. Yeah, I, I've actually worked with a number of 12 year olds um, who've gone through our programming who have expressed a real need and desire for you know therapy um, and whose parents have not been open to that and nobody you know no adults at the school you know, no one could do that for for the family and the child couldn't did not have the agency to get the services that they needed because parents did not consent yeah yeah I think one of the biggest impacts that I'm also hearing is that because people are young as they're going through this they have a greater impact in their development longer term. It's not just as if, you know, this was happening to another adult or that this is a teen phase. Um, you know, when, when young people are treated this way by their teachers, their parents, their community members who are older, it's their entry point to understanding the rest of life. Um, and so this makes me really curious knowing that we do work with a, with a focus in relationships how does adultism relate to intimate partner violence? What's the intersection there? Yeah, I think that's a really important question um, and really similar to, you know, what you're saying, Neva. Um, you know, there's a really clear connection. Um, you know, abusive intimate relationships are based on power and control. Um, and if children are taught that their time, their decisions, and even their own bodies can be controlled by adults, then, you know, how, how can they be expected to navigate, you know, balancing, you know, balance and mutuality um, in their in their intimate relationships. Um, you know, and obviously there's there's nuance here. Um, you know, many, many parents do try to give like many parents, teachers, adults who work with the young person do give young people progressively more and more agency and do share power. Um, and that's really important. But when that when that doesn't happen, um, it can really set kids up for, um, you know, some really uh, troubling uh, troubling situations. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think of young kids who are, um, and again, like, like Hillary said, parents are often parenting on a spectrum and not every parent who, um, you know, <laughs> parents a certain way will have, you know, broken boundaries with their kid. But I think often of like this you know, for example, corporal punishment and like this um, very generational, very um, just ingrained idea that like bodily punishment is okay for kids. But when we turn into adults, it becomes legally wrong for us to hit other adults. So why is it okay for us to do that with our own children? Um, you know, we're teaching kids that it's okay for their bodily autonomy and their emotional autonomy um, to be hurt by those in, in power and those who care about them or you know they care about them their parents um you know even even things that you could consider like maybe a, a microaggression um strangers uh touching toddlers or babies without asking for permission parents um kind of grabbing their children and dragging them through the store if they're crying or throwing a tantrum and like hillary said these are all things that like some parents like have to do but you know I feel like our society doesn't emphasize the value of cultivating that autonomy for our children from a young age and cultivating the idea 
that they are allowed to say no and express their own wants and needs and, and exert their own power. Um, and yeah, when we as adults do not model healthy relationships in front of our children, they, they will absorb that. And oftentimes, um, you know, the students who are exhibiting or the young kids who are exhibiting abusive or harmful behaviors, they learn that from somewhere, right? So it's, it's so imperative that we, we as adults just, again, internally look at, look at our internal biases and behaviors that stem from adultism and really that that just has a lot of intersections with how we relate to other adults and then model that behavior for future generations. Um, so I think that that plays a big part in it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think those are really clear, um, you know, examples. I, you know, I also think things like privacy, you know, and again, like there's always nuance to these discussions, but like parent, you know, there's so much tra tracking, you know, of young people, um, you know, kids talk about that a lot in group, how it's like, you know, we, we talk about privacy in, in intimate relationships and tracking and they're like, well, our, you know, our parents, you know, track our phones. Um, and some, and, and I think the, the real thing is consent, right? And if, if, if kids are understanding why that is happening and they're having conversations and they're having choice, an agency in that and like, yeah, this is to make sure I'm safe if I'm like an hour late and my family doesn't know where I am, right? It's not just to, you know, track me every every step of the way to see where I'm at and who I'm with all day. Um, but I think that also is something that can be really, really normalized. Um, and then just switching, switching gears on this question. Um, I also think it's really important to note that um, controlling behaviors from adults is often especially um, especially acute or especially like common um, for kids who are already at higher risk of entering into abusive relationships. So, you know, just thinking back to my own experience working with kids in foster care, um, you know, and um, some occasionally working with kids who were in um, juvenile detention programs, um, though I certainly didn't work on site, you know, there was a lot of overlap with the, the kids I was working with. Um, kids who have a lot of trauma and, and kids who've often witnessed domestic violence themselves from parents, peers, community members are often punished and controlled, um, you know, often with an intent or an expressed intent of protecting or rehabilitating them. Um, but, you know, I mean, what, what, what do we think happens when, when, we're, when we're treating children like they're, they're prisoners, um, when we're not allowing them, the children who have already been traumatized uh, and then are continuing to go through um, trauma and being controlled by other adults, not giving choice, uh, being given choices, not being given agency. Um, you know, it, again, just further sets up those kids who are already, already at risk for, for continued harm and continued victimization um, or perpetration. Um. So we have one question. Um, when you, well, we actually might have a second one. I'm just going to read the first one out first. When you are doing prevention work in schools, how do you help teachers understand adultism and to change their mindset? I can go. Um, so I think we haven't had as much experience directly talking with teachers yet about adultism, though we're preparing for it. And this is really, really awesome because we're getting our, our brains going on facilitating these conversations. But, you know, we do have our pilot program with Robert Eagle staff. That's going to be our teen leadership council where we will actually be recruiting students to, you know, give their feedback on the curriculum that we're giving and, and, and identify the issues that they and their community are excited about and want to want to talk about. Um, and I think providing opportunities like that and really leading by example is a great way to show to show both parents and students and administration like you know these are your students like these are th these are the young people who are going to be fixing the problems that our generations and older have caused and left for them. And we can't ignore that. And we can't pretend that they're gonna turn 18 one day and just all of a sudden like 
be able to go out and, and do things <laughs> like that. Um, so I think it's really important that we cultivate that, that youth-led leadership and youth-led organizing, um, emphasize youth and adult partnerships, uh, and really just, just be humble and, and defer to them, defer to young people in telling us what they think, what are their experiences, what they think we should be prioritizing and actually listening to that and, and taking that valuable knowledge and insight. Um, because it's one thing, I think I think of Greta Thunberg and um, her addressing, you know, the people and she's like, adults are always blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we, we can say that we're listening to the youth so many times and it's a matter of actually actually doing active listening and, and integrating the things that they are telling us in our conversations um so really just just asking you know like and challenging our own internalized adultism of course uh just when we catch ourselves thinking oh they're young they don't know what they're talking about they need more experience like actually catching that and um you know just really unpacking why we're thinking that like what can we do to fight that internal voice um what do you think Hillary? I think you summed it up really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're just excited to be doing like, we're just now starting to get a lot more opportunities to train teachers. Um, and Mish is doing a lot of work right now on developing some new content to add to our, um, our trainings on adultism. Um, and, you know, otherwise, you know, it's really, it's been over the years, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. If, if, a, if a child has expressed you know, something going on with a teacher or a counselor, um, depending on the relationship that I have with the folks involved, I'll just have a one on one with them, um, you know, with the with the child's consent, um, like ways that we can better navigate or they might be able to better support support um, the child. Um, things like things like that. And sometimes like advocating, you know, there have been times where kids have reported things that that teachers are doing and and listening to them and then being an adult who is also reporting to administration that we're hearing these things and, and that this is a real legitimate concern from a young person. And unfortunately, um, it's often taken more seriously when it's coming from an adult than when it's coming from a child. So being an ally in that way. And then uh, I think that's really great. One, the, uh, one other thing I would add to that is just, again, being humble and practicing humility when we as adults don't know the answer or don't know what we're talking about and actually being transparent and owning up to that and being like, um, you know, I don't know how to start this conversation with you yet, but I'm going to look into it. Or I don't know the answer to your question yet. I'm going to look into it. Or just like, you know, I, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> like, e simple things like that that we really need to actively integrate into our lives um which can be hard depending on you know like our background and experience but it's it's really valuable to practice just like you know actually being engaged with young people and actually being enthusiastically interested in what they have to say and admitting when we are wrong or don't know or because i think that's really important for both us and them to remember that adults are people too and we are not not fallible, infallible, so. We have one last question, but we are almost out of time. So maybe if each person can take a minute each answering this, um, knowing that young people don't fully develop until 25, um, how can a parent have a healthy relationship with their child balancing adultism, but keeping he healthy boundaries and expectations? Sorry, I was having a lot of issues pressing the unmute button. Um, yeah, I mean, that is not a quick answer to that. Um, and I'm a new parent, so there's a lot of things that I can talk about now, but I'm not gonna really fully understand until I'm in that position in a few years. Um, but I would say really like when you do, like boundaries and limits are important for any relationship. Um, and I, I think really just explaining, even, even if there's a fit, even if there's door slamming and I hate use, just explaining calmly, like why you are setting the limit that you're setting, it, give as many choices and as many options as possible in the context. And, you know, I, I think that that is really a good starting place is to not just ever be like, well, this is because I'm the adult, 
this is because I'm the apparent. And that's why you have to do this thing. Like that's, that's not going to cut it. Um, that's not going to help kids understand, de- develop, that's not going to help them develop skills um, for navigating um, complex relationships. So um, that's where I'd start, Mish. Yeah, I, I agree, Hillary. Um, I was going to say emotional transparency and emotional cultivation is something that we're trying to actively integrate into our curriculum this year and in our, you know, just future lessons. Um, I think that is something that us adults need to really work on as well, both for ourselves and our interactions with young people. So when we're saying like, oh, you know, I, I, I implement these rules, I have these guidelines, it's because I love you and I care about you and I, I care about your safety and I, I want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're safe and I trust you. Um, so, you know, being introspective enough to really know your feelings and the reasons why you're, you're interacting with the young folk person the way you are. Um, and also being mindful of that and the power dynamics like we're talking about because it's hard. And, uh, but as long as we're aware, I think that's great, great step. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for all your questions. Any last questions? Anything that people want to get answered after our session? We'll be sending the questions to Misha and Hillary if there's any remaining ones. You can privately message me if if that's your preference. Um, well, if there's any, um, if there's no other questions at this moment, um, or if there's any comments people would like to say, uh, we have a comment from Genevieve. Thank you, Misha and Hillary. This was a new framework. Rochelle, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Hillary and Mish. It's so good to have this conversation with people I work with and just kind of like um, everything you all were saying was, so, was just wonderful to hear. It's really important that um, if there's anything we can impart usually with folks, it's really adultism because once you understand adultism, you can really break down um, how you interact with young people and why, why is it that you act a certain way. And I appreciate Hillary all of your experiences stemming back from Lawrence, Kansas, bringing them here to New Beginnings um, and really seeing the new growth of our social change team. And thank you, Mish, for bringing all of your experience in suicide prevention, housing, homelessness. Um, I just really appreciate all of your passion and dedication to youth um, in this field. Um, lots and lots of thank yous. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone who has come to our speaker series. If you've come here before or if you're new, we just are so appreciative that you've joined us this month. This is the first time we've done this um, for a whole series in the month, and we are really excited to keep the momentum going. So if you liked what you've seen so far, we have more coming for you. Um, stay tuned, and we'll send you some emails. So we'll follow up this session, and we'll hopefully once we have the next session set in November and onwards, give you information on how that is going to work. Um, we're really excited to start the next year with DVAM. Um, I know it's not a clean 2021, 20, 2022 year, but you know, hey, DVAM is just the beginning and we're really excited to keep the momentum up. Um, thank you all. Hope you have a wonderful mm -hmm. afternoon. Thank you, Napa. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. Great Bye. to see y'all here.